Hello everybody, welcome back again. Um, today, if you've understood um, what's going on so far with the logical subjects and how the whole system works, uh, you can apply that same method of learning to the, what I did uh, for the logical, it'll be the same for the connotative interpretive subjects. And as I said, the connotative interpretive subjects are the, are the subjects where we interpret meaning through mood, tone, feeling, atmosphere. Okay, so we're trying to show that within the different texts, the artworks we work with. And so these are the subjects, as I said, um, English, the visual arts, uh, dance, drama, the language other than English, the aesthetic subjects, the photographies. <clears throat> so we'll get right into this. As I said, every topic can be broken up into parts. For the connotative interpretive subjects, you'll, be, you'll see I'll be using the same wording for alarm, but I'm going to try to use the meta language, the actual language or the, the meta language of what we do with our subject. So where I come into name and define, where I said for the logical was the areas, specifically for us, it's the significant events in the story or in the artwork. So I'm, or the parts of it is what I'm looking at. So how do I choose those? How am I supposed to choose the right events that are in the story? Or even if I'm going to write a story, how do I make my events significant? The way to find this out is, is, is like this. Outside here sits our syllabus. That's our God. Someone tells us we've got to teach this. They don't tell us how exactly, but they tell us this is the what we have to teach. So I ask, well, in our subject, we are really helping kids learn through story. Okay? And what I want to know is, if, in, in, if the syllabus sits here, alarm sits here, we have to learn from a story. So my question is this. If I'm teaching through story and using story, even the logical subjects are doing that, even a, a, a maths formula is really telling a story, or an equation is really telling a story, how do I learn from a story? Because you're not all in front of me, especially with this video, uh, I hear different answers like, oh, I empathize with it. Okay, that's the storytelling. But what am I meant to empathize with? Or someone will say, you read it. Good, if you're reading it. What are you reading? What are you looking for specifically? How do I learn from a story? A simple answer, and I didn't make this up exactly, is from a story, there's always a sort of a narrative structure. And the basic thing to every story, there is a problem. Somewhere along the line, the character or the subject or the, the person who's making the artwork has a problem. It can be a problem, a challenge, something to overcome, something not quite right. So if I can find what that is, then I, I have a beginning of where to begin choosing the significant events. I want you to realize something too. With the problem though, the problem is either inner, within the character, the persona, or the composer, or it's outer, between the character, the persona, or the composer, and their outer world. So we're making, making, helping kids see that there are really these two worlds operating. In visual arts, I might just say here, <coughs> Sometimes just the choice of what medium to use to express myself is a problem. So trying to right from there choose which, where it is, is the beginning point. Once is, and I might ask this, is anybody in the room or out in the world, anybody here not have a problem? Uh, I'd like to learn from that. <laughs> anyway. This problem, once, and I don't know about you, every time I go to try to solve a problem, something comes along to make 
that problem, to, so, to solve, to find a solution to the problem, makes it complicated. So there's a complication. And so as the story progresses, the complication, 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 depends on the length of the story, happens time and time again, until finally there is a resolution, or a non-resolution to either the inner or outer, or both. So when I can learn what the problem is, I learn maybe if the complication is overcome or not, then I can learn through the resolution or the non-resolution. And so then I learn. Because what I'm saying is, the character, the main character of what I'm speaking about, of a story, can become something like the representation of our humanity. And either that representation of our humanity is up, or it's down. And what they do to solve the situation can apply to all of us. So, how do I learn from this event? From the story, the plot. And I'm following that, I'm allowing the story to teach me. Once I see that, for describe the features, characteristics, as I said, for the logical, So every text has its features, you know, every medium of text has a particular form, features about it, but it also has language techniques. But what is a language technique? It, we give it a name, but for instance, and how I might teach what a technique is, I say, okay, see that, there's a door over there, yeah? Is that a door? Kids go, yeah. Is the door closed? And they look at me and go, yeah. I say, is that a window? And they think I'm nuts. And they say, yeah, that's a window. And I say, no, it's not too hard yet, okay. Let's take that door and say, okay, if the door is shut, have you ever spoken to anybody in your whole life whose mind is a closed door? And they go, oh yeah, my mom, my mother, my girlfriend, my friend. Okay, I said, so if that's the case, where I call it a metaphor, I say, okay, what happened to the door? And some of them say, oh, it's like a figure of my imagination. That's right. We've got this quantum leap of going from here to here to the language technique. From here, so what is the purpose of a technique? What's it trying to do? And what we find is, the technique positions me. It positions us in the place. And that position can either be mentally, uh, physically, Sensually, imaginatively, <laughs> so it strikes us and puts us in the position. Okay, in other words, what I'm saying is, it gives us a sense of immediacy. gives us a sense of immediacy where it becomes the I, more or less, here, now. And that's the artwork. It's putting me here with the composer, or here with the character, in their inner or outer world. With this sense of immediacy, I can be here with them. And that's the position I can now become part of. Once I have the technique understood, and I go to the explain significance for us, which is the purpose of the technique, 
the function of the technique, what is it? Again, what is the purpose of a technique? And what we find is that it creates something for us. And this really is the, the crunch of the matter of the subject, is the purpose is it creates an effect, a mood, tone, feeling, atmosphere. And again, it's inner, the inner atmosphere, feeling of the character, the composer, or outer. With this, what's the purpose of this is to create empathy. A feeling of at one with the character or the composer and their inner or outer world. I'm feeling at one with them. Let me give you a for instance, because I want to teach a word here. For described features, I'm just going to use the word emulate. And through that emulation, I can create this empathy. Um, there's a beautiful poem by Robert Frost called Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. And it runs something like this, and I'll read it with a little dramatic feeling. And it says, because he changed the vowel structure a little bit, it says, whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. You see, he's, he's either sitting on a horse or he's in a horse and buggy, and he's emulating the movement that he's in to position us through that emulation to come to some kind of mood, tone, feeling. Perhaps that feeling is of meditative feeling or solace or peace, quiet. And the movement is taking it this way. So much of around us, our music, for instance, take, take, I remember I went to a Jimi Hendrix concert. I didn't really know who he was at the time. This guy walks out, has his guitar, and he goes, bang! I went, oh my gosh, he's mad about something. I could tell just by that technique, I could feel there was an anger almost. Especially when he starts breaking up the guitar, lighting it and throwing it at us. We knew. So even our music, you know, rap music, rock and roll, it was rocking and rolling. It was shaking up the world. Country music, you know, oh, my girlfriend went away with my best friend and she took my dog. And there's this long drawn out feeling of, oh my gosh, I'm sorry about that. But I'm feeling this time stretches. <laughs> Just like, especially when your emotions kind of get all drawn out. I'm not playing. But our music is that. The first time I ever danced to a Greek music, da 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 you're in it. It's part of you. And you feel the life, and sometimes the loss of life, in different areas. That's this significance. That's where it's taking us to this world. And finally, I can empathize through the storytelling. Once I can feel that, where I come to analyze, which again is the explain, the how, the why. I'm wanting to know how it works. How is this working? How is this inner and outer world happening between them? And again, I think the separation comes, again that semicolon, where I begin talking about the impact on relationships. Again, 
Those relationships are inner and outer. I sometimes say, well, if this, if this mood tone feeling, which for right now is a positive and or negative feeling, yeah, then certainly I can feel from that feeling whether the relationship is splitting apart or coming together. I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. Are they coming closer to whatever is around them, to themselves? Or are they being coming distanced away from themselves or away from their world? They can begin informing us of their relatedness. I used to use the word relatedness, where someone is in relationship with themselves, how we relate to ourselves, and a relationship between us and our outer world. This becomes a deeper analysis. So many times I see papers being marked and they'll say, need to analyze deeper. But can you explain it? What are they meant to do? And again, I draw the line here. Because this is our content. It's not quite so much where I can learn that by rote, exactly. Because for, for kids to feel, is, is, it has to come from within them themselves. But they do need to know the content up to this point of our subject. They have to know the story. They have to know how it's operating. But the, this line of division, this point of no return, as I called it before, is where I'm putting now the kids a bit more in charge of their learning. Because I want them, once they see this relationship or lack of relationship, then I want them to be able to interpret meaning. Now this level of meaning at this stage, it's a little bit different because from the logical interpretive subjects, this is the very, a very key difference in our matrix here. Because what I mean by interpret meaning at this level is at the textual, universal level. So as I said, if the character, for instance, is a representation of our humanity, either that humanity is up or it's down, and I'm learning some meaning of something, how it stands for all of us. How do you teach this meaning? How do you help kids learn this meaning? Up to this level. Okay, I'll give you another for instance. There's a beautiful short story, or a, a fable. It's called The Moth and the Star by James Thurber. And the first sentence reads, there once was a young and impressionable moth who set his heart on a certain star. That's just the first sentence, but can I get meaning even from that? Levels of meaning. So for instance, most kids find out and they don't have too much trouble saying star is a goal or an ambition in life, something to reach. Maybe the star is inner within the character or between them and their world. That's up for the student to feel that. But there are these words that where he set his heart. I get this feeling from that setting of a heart within the moth himself. And you get this feeling, different kids will say different things. And this is the beauty of teaching this because you'll hear different feelings come from kids. One of the most common ones is that I get is um, determined. He's determined to reach that star. Because they get the, the metaphor of the star, but setting his heart, what does it symbolize? Oh, he's very determined. He gets this feeling of determination. Okay. And I might say, okay, if he's determined, 
And I'm trying to reach them to get this, you know, he's, he's trying to connect, tra create a relationship. Hmm, just thought of something. How does determination help us set up relationships? I just, hmm, that's interesting. I'll have to ask my class sometime. But for meaning, is determination important for attaining a goal in life? And they go, oh yeah, without determination, you can't, you can't reach a goal. I say, wonderful. What you've arrived at is a theme. A universal theme from the textual level. I could go deeper. And maybe you could think about this. It's that line, point of no return type question. And, and again, I go back to this. The art of teaching is what questions can I have between these? And that's, that's, that's always new for us. So I ask this question, okay, if determination is important for reaching the goal, I ask a simple question, why? What is it about determination that allows me, or without it, I can't reach a goal? It's necessary to reach a goal. I'll leave that answer up to you. But it's, it leaves them wondering. From this, and I, I think we need to spend a little time with this, especially in the younger years where they, because I'll say, how do you learn a meaning from a story? And I should have said, one of the answers I get is, oh, you learn a theme. I said, okay, that's what you learn. But how do I actually, what am I doing to help kids arrive at a theme? Once I see this meaning at the textual level, okay, the artworks level, to critically analyze, where I'm explaining how, why, concerning my positives, and or negatives. Here's something that sets us apart um, in, our, in our subject area, in this connotative interpretive subjects. Because either I'm trying to see the positives and negatives of the language techniques to give me that meaning, I'm trying to see, is it enhancing meaning, contributing to meaning, promoting the meaning with that technique? Or is it obscuring it? If I'm marking a kid's paper, does it help me arrive at meaning or is it kind of too obscure for me to, to understand it? So I can begin with these positives and negatives. I begin weighing up the language techniques themselves to really serve the purpose for the meaning. Language techniques serve a purpose for meaning. Purpose and meaning are they're like two separate things. Purpose and meaning. But you can't have one without the other. So if I have a technique and it's serving a purpose, does it suit the meaning I'm trying to get across? The other thing we have to deal with, and I'll just use this word, is the experience of the character or the composer, the artist, the storyteller. What's that experience? Was it positive or negative? And I can follow this as well, right through. <coughs> I have this mood tone, within or without, within the character or the composer, and I come up to this point, well, what is their relationship with themselves? And I have to make a real distinction between anal analyzing this critically analyzed because, okay, once I say, okay, the, the relationship is splitting apart, I then ask, well, why is that a positive thing? Because it can be. Or why is it a negative thing? So I'm trying to find out with that young little moth in the star who set his heart on a certain star. 
The next sentence reads, but his mother counseled him, fly to the bridge lamp instead. His father said, you don't get anywhere flying to a star. Go around the house lamps. Immediately, is he coming closer or getting apart from his parents? How is this either beneficial or harmful? And again, I'm asking the kids, I'm not telling them an answer, I'm, I'm asking questions to help them come across that line. And remember, I call that the line of reflection. I'm wanting them to reflect on something for themselves. It is a tremendous risk <laughs> to say, well, I think this. That is a risk. Take a chance. What do you feel? What do you think? Again, alarm is about this learning and responding for higher, a gradation of higher order learning skills. It's not just thinking. So I'm trying to get them to, one, feel the experience. Once you can feel the experience yourself, now you can be, be, begin figuring out for yourself why is that beneficial or harmful, and advantage, disadvantage. Once I can see this, once I can feel this positives and negatives and start weighing it up, then I'm actually teaching the skill of how to evaluate. Which means to what extent. I'll just use this word, effective. Yeah, successful. And again, every subject has its own words here at this point for whatever it is I'm trying to evaluate. And again, it's each technique or each experience. It just depends what we're after, what we're trying to achieve, what our goal is. But now they can evaluate each one on its own until now through the critically evaluate to what extent overall. All the techniques. How are all the techniques combining together to create a whole story? It's kind of like music where you have an orchestra and not just one, one maybe playing on alone, but when they, how do they all combine to create the same music? How do all the techniques combine to work together or not? How do all the experiences of the character combine? How do they work together throughout this to create the story as a whole? So I'm trying to see overall, and it's the same as in logical, the same skill, it's just I'm using a little bit different process. Not process, feeling here. Once they critically evaluate, to conceptualize the topic. Realize it could be a topic, it could be the story, it could be a unit, a module, and I'm trying to put again the big idea or the big picture. And as I said, even the one line can come down to a concept. What I have to do is link the theme, the message, 
to the concept. I shouldn't say that's all you have to do. That's a, that's a quantum leap. Some kids can never get there. But I don't want to stop the chance that they might. I want to help a kid live his possibility. And if it's possible, at least it'll open them. Open them to what might they never have achieved before. So I'm trying to link this message to this concept. And finally, once they can link it, for instance, um, let me go back for one second. He's trying to reach a goal, this moth. And I'm wondering about this technique of he's reaching the star, set his heart, he has to overcome the complications of people standing in his way. And I can go back, what, and he's on this journey, or what we do is one topic is called belonging. If he belongs within himself, he's connected within himself through his own determination. He made his own choice. I can ask, why, is, why are choices so important to our belonging to ourselves? How, do, how does a choice shape a relationship for inner belonging, the discovery of my inner truth? Once they get this, once they can see this, I wonder, I want them to be able to appreciate such a big idea, which means for intrinsic learning, link this idea, this learning to life. That's intrinsic. Kids at the beginning say, why are we going to learn about the moth? What's a moth? Why are we going to do belonging? Why are we going to do journeys or change? Why are we supposed to be doing this? Good question. And I ask, is it important you have determination to reach a goal? Yeah. Is it important you have a goal in life? Well, yeah. Is it important that you have choices in your life to live your life? Yeah, <laughs> and I say, why? Perhaps you can find meaning in your life. Maybe you can find purpose in life. And again, you ask, continue asking why. I should have told you, when I get below this line, I ask five whys. I think it was Benjamin Franklin who came up with those. Interesting read. I can ask five whys and kids say, hey, you sound like a two-year-old. Why, 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 why? And I go, but I'm, these are serious whys. Why is it important I belong to myself? Why is it I make choices for my journey in life? See, I don't want to give the answer. I want to come up with this question to help serve this skill of reflection. I mean, I do want the answer, but I want the skill to live this, this, this life of reflection for oneself. The next step, so that's intrinsic. For extrinsic, some wise guy is going to come along, <coughs> namely me sometimes, or our big exams, and they have to link their learning for themselves to a question. Nobody can do that for them. When they sit down for a test, I'm not there. So they have to please, don't come with a ready-made answer, look at the question, develop your thesis, your th your, through your theme and say what you want to say. So many times we're, I hear teachers, oh, I can't write an essay, can't write an essay. And I say, okay, you can't write an essay unless you have something to say. If you have something to say, you can write an essay. And it's sort of, I know it sounds 
trite, <laughs> but it's so true. Unless I have something to say, I can't sort of, and, and I can say it through how I arrived at the answer. If they can learn to apply this learning to their life, if they can value this, what they learn about how to reflect in life, how to learn from a story, an artwork, and they can apply it to life, maybe can, they can love learning. I think that's sort of the ultimate, where you can find the value to my learning, to my, my application of my learning to my life. Again, this just follows a natural pattern of how I can learn. And again, it can pop up and become my marking guideline. I'm helping the kids, assisting the kids when they have to respond to something. The same system works where if you remember when I talked about how things flip up, this then, if they, can, if they can do this first, if they can come to this point, and this now becomes right at the beginning of their answer. I try to get kids to say, okay, what's, even that one sentence can now be a thesis. It can be the first sentence to a, to a paragraph, or if I do the whole story to become one idea, one big connected idea about this concept, that becomes first. And then all this comes through to show and teach another what I've learned. And that's what, that's what this is, learning and teaching. I'm learning, I'm teaching. You, if you learn something, it'll come right back at you. In the logical subjects, I said, we go through the what, the why, how, how well, so what, <laughs> what do I learn? And that's also a so what. You say, why do I have to learn that? For this subject, we have to go through five levels of meaning. At this level, I'm in the literal factual story itself. That's the literal level of learning. But with this subject, our quantum leap sometimes begins here. Because now from the literal, as I said with that metaphor, oh, like I said, uh, have you ever spoken to anybody whose mind is a closed door? They go, oh yeah. They know what I'm talking about. But so many times kids will say, why didn't he just tell us they're thick as a post or they're, they're hard as a rock? And we're using figurative level of meaning. And that's why they're doing it. That's how they're doing it. Then I go through these reasoning, if you like, skills. They're, they're sort of I don't know if they're meaning, but they're reasoning skills. You know, anal analyzing is a skill of, of, of uh, reasoning things out through feeling. Once I interpret meaning at this level, as I said, I'm now teaching at the thematic level of meaning. So we're kind of responsible for levels of meaning. Once it goes to the thematic, I'm now going to the conceptual. And as I said, to help shape a learning community, we're trying to have this transferability of skill. And this conceptual level, if I can help a kid in my lower classes arrive at a concept, maybe he'll take it over to another subject. At least he'll know what he's looking for. Hopefully they'll just kind of feel, oh, I'm not quite getting it. And they'll be able to arrive at questions for themselves to arrive at conceptual. 
I suppose at this level, once we go to conceptual, we're learning, sorry, about life. So we're going literal, figurative, thematic, conceptual, life. If you want one more, what is love? It's part of our human spirit or beyond, if that's the case. So we can reach all these levels of meaning through the, through the story. Our character can arrive there at the different levels themselves. Some characters are stuck. Some characters don't learn a message. Some do. See, these are our characters. These, this is our life. And that's how we can find sort of a connection or a connectedness through the artwork, through the text, through the story. I, as I said right at the beginning, I've sometimes been accused of a backwards teacher, <laughs> back to front. Um, and I do go about that. So many times people say teaching and learning. To me, this learning is an aspect of what it is to be human. I remember reading, it was a story either called The Social Contract or The Territorial Imperative, and I can't for right now think of the composer or the author right now. But he gave this line, if a species stops teaching its young and the young don't learn, it'll be the end of the species. This learning is something, it's part of, an amoeba learns. If it doesn't learn, it stops. So the process begins here, with the learning. It's part of our human nature. We are as human beings where we are because we're learners. And if we don't pass on this learning, what, what will happen to us? I'd just like to close with that. Because, maybe one more thing. What is it that starts the procedure? What is it that helps me? Okay, I'm learning, now what? How do I get it rolling? How do we start this process? Is basically, it begins with the question. The question is a step into the unknown. I don't know. I step into it willing to listen and that's what reflection is it's an inner listening and hopefully we can share this with each other <laughs>